then um, with uh, with chapter four, that's where we got the the latter verses of Galatians three. The apostle Paul had introduced the fact that we are the sons of God, that we are, as he's going to say in chapter sixteen, we are all a part of the Israel of God, uh, based upon God's Spirit being with us, and that there is no distinction as far as uh, Jew or Gentile, male or female, bond or free. And um, so anyhow, in chapter four, as I mentioned in the prayer, Paul, uh, Peter said that Paul writes some things hard to understand and that others will take his words and twist them and rest them. And chapter four, like chapter three, is certainly one of those areas. So we got to the beginning of chapter four, and here he says, now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all. And so he's using, uh, he's expanding on the analogy that he opened up at the end of chapter three. And all of the the peoples there, Jews, Greeks, Romans, they all had some type of a ceremony that marked a child's coming to age. Uh, among the Jewish societies, even to this day, they have their bar mitzvah uh, at age 13, where a, uh, a young person is recognized as being of a certain age where they are fully responsible and accountable to God for keeping the law on their own. But the Greek word for child refers to a person who is too intellectually and spiritually immature to face the responsibilities of adulthood. And so there is this guardian that he speaks of in verse 2. Verse 2, but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the father. So the guardians protected they saw to the day-to-day -day care. They would escort a child to school. Uh, he also worked with some of the actual teaching himself. But the steward was the one who had the oversight of the family inheritance, the family wealth. Now, when I every time I read this area, I I think of the the uh, the monarchy there in Great Britain in the United Kingdom uh, for. My entire life, there's been Prince Charles, who is the crown prince, and yet Queen Elizabeth has lived to a very ripe age, and Prince Charles, and of course then his son, who is now, you know, the next in line after his father, and then he has children. But there always have been these individuals behind the scenes who have been taking care of the children, teaching and training them. So in verse three, even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. All right, now here we're already going to need to stop and pause. The elements of the world, that's, that's an awful sounding phrase. But I think as we get to this verse, let's remind ourselves that the Apostle Paul in the churches here of Galatia, basically Lystra, Derby, uh, Iconium, um, Antioch, and Pisidia. So basically those areas, you have two groups. Paul would always go to the Jewish community first, and then he would go to the Gentile. And we see that sometimes Paul refers to we, and he's speaking to other Jewish Christians like himself. And then other times he will talk about these people who came out of paganism and used to serve other gods. And then, and then he's speaking to the Gentile element. But here is the fact that uh, when we once upon a time, we all were under someone's temporary guardianship. Now, in these earlier verses, such as verse 3, even so we, when we were children, and that gives us a clue. Of course, we have to take it within the context. 
but that gives us a clue that he's speaking to the Jewish Christians in those congregations. They were under the elements of the world. And again, that just, that sounds like an awful phrase, especially when this phrase is greatly abused. There are those who will take that and they'll say, see, he's saying the law is awful. And that's not what he's saying at all. But the Greek word from whence we get elements in English is stoichion. And stoichion basically has two different meanings. Uh, on the one hand, it's a, a basic, okay, I need to correct the spelling there, basic guiding principle of a, a pattern of thinking. Or on the other hand, it's the actual elements of which the physical universe is composed. Now that second meaning, which is not a, what we have here, but Peter used this same word stoichion in 2 Peter 3 verse 10, when he said, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. So we look at the uh, periodic table of uh, different elements that you are introduced to in chemistry and you have, oh, 100 and I think the number has continued to grow, but 100 and some different elements that are the building blocks of matter of the physical universe. So Peter used the word in that, in that sense. However, Paul uses it here, and he's referring to principles of thought. Now, as we get down to verse 8, verse 9, uh, yeah, verse 8, it says, but then indeed when you did not know God, you served those which by nature are not gods. Again, remember, he has two audiences. And Paul, as he did in chapter three, he does it a lot of times in his writing. You, you and I expect him to tell us, okay, now I'm speaking to this part of the church. And then when he shifts gear, we want him to tell us, okay, I'm now speaking to this group. So when we get to verse eight, he begins speaking to those who had come out of paganism. They had worshiped other gods. But in these earlier verses, we're talking, he's speaking of the Jewish Christians. Now, <clears throat> verse 8, when he gets to the Gentiles, they had formerly served other gods. And then when we get to verse 9, they're turning back again to weaken beggar, beggarly elements. But we, we need to go back up to verse 3. Verse 3 focuses on the Gentile Christians. And remember, the word that we keep going back to, and that is the Judaizers. You had some Jews traveling around within the church trying to get newly converted Gentiles to go back, or rather to take them to Judaism, that they had to come under the law, meaning not just Ten Commandments that are eternal, but also the other laws that were added after the events of Mount Sinai. You have the entire sacrificial law. So they wanted them to come back under circumcision, just as one example. That's the example he'll use in chapter 5. He keeps going back to circumcision. So there were Jews who were now in the church who were in danger of reverting back to the Judaizers' dogma that they needed to go back to sacrifices, back to washings, back to circumcision, etc. They wanted them to go back. Okay, scrolling the notes up. <clears throat> now, these laws were God's tutor, God's schoolmaster, that were temporary. Now, again, the basic Ten Commandments are spiritual. They are eternal. They have always been. But there was a sacrificial ritualistic law that was added that pointed them to the coming 
complete, perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And when he fulfilled all of that, they were no longer needed. So some of the teachers wanted them to go back. And Paul, in the beginning of chapter 3, he was just amazed how quickly they were going back to what he away from what he had taught them. So, uh, you know, look at it as Paul has two different brush fires and he's trying to deal with them both at the same time. As we get to verse nine again, there are Gentile Christians newly converted who are being drawn back into some of the elements of paganism. In verse four, in verse four, very, very important scripture, but when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, because it was still the time of the old covenant, not only the eternal law of God, but also all of the laws that would continue until the Lamb of God paid the price and they were rendered null and void. But God has a timetable. He has a plan. And it, it's marvelous, the beauty of that plan, that there was a, a precise and exact religious, cultural, political situation on the earth. And that is precisely exactly when Jesus Christ came, born of Mary. And uh, he came to live and to sacrifice, give himself as a sacrifice as the Lamb of God. And Jesus growing up in the day and age of the old covenant, he was obligated to perfectly keep all of those laws. And unlike anyone else, he was able to do so. Well, continuing, verse 3, this is why he was, he was to come, to redeem. To redeem is to buy back. To redeem those who are under the law. The law that we try to keep, we break. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We, we incur a death penalty. So to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. God's plan would be to buy humans back from the death penalty. The price would be paid on our behalf. And through the process, God could fully, legally, in every sense, adopt us as his very sons and daughters. Verse 6, and because you are sons, again, writing to the church, really both groups, the Jewish Christians, the Gentile Christians, you are sons. You have been adopted as a part of the very family. God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And that's that Aramaic word, Abba, Daddy, Papa, very, very uh, close, intimate term of endearment between a father and a, and a child. The spirit of Christ is the same as the spirit of the Father. They are one. Therefore, you are no longer a slave but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Jesus Christ. Okay, I, I hope that's clear enough. Think of that first seven verses as being addressed largely to Jewish Christians who were being pulled back under some of the ritualistic law. Now, Verse 8, this is where he pivots. He doesn't make it all that clear, but he now begins speaking from the context. He begins speaking to the Gentile Christians. But then, indeed, when you did not know God, you served those which by nature are not God, uh, God's. So clearly he's not speaking to fellow Jewish Christians who had grown up in homes where they revered the law. He's speaking to people who had come from the Gentile world, who had had no background in Christianity or Judaism or any awareness of the law of God. Verse 9. And now, 
after you have known God. So you were called, you're a part of the body of Christ, you are Christ's, and or rather are known by God. You know, God has given you his spirit. How is it that you turn again? Now, remember that phrase, you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage. So by this phrase, Paul would never use the phrase weak and beggarly elements to refer to God's, God's entire law, including the Sabbath and the holy days which were days he kept and taught to the church. And in fact, this is the same man you see in the notes there, Romans 7, verses or verse 12. Of the law, Paul said, therefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. And in fact, in Hebrews 9, verses 9 and 10, he mentioned the law, he's, verse 10, he says, food, drinks, various washings and ordinances. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience. And so he mentions there, verse 10, at the end, it was imposed until the time of reformation. And Paul is pointing out, Christ came. He paid the price. We live in a whole new age now. So, verse 9, Paul is addressing Gentile converts. Let's keep that in mind. And so, if they came from worshiping other gods, the phrase turn again could not refer to them turning back to the Sabbath and the holy days. Again, this is an area where there are those who twist the scripture and pull it out and proof text. And they say, okay, Paul called the Sabbath a weak and beggarly element. No, he did not. That's not what it's saying. It could only have been used in reference to the Greco-Roman pantheon of false gods. And there was an early form of Gnosticism, and it's, it had a, a primary focus that looked to astrology. And it is in astrology, you have all kinds of days and months and years and all kinds of things set aside. So let's go on to verse 10. You observe, again, his audience, the newly converted Jew, Gentile Christians. You observe days and months and seasons and years. Now let's stop and think about that. God never set aside a month as something to be caught, uh, kept. There are days within certain seasons. There are, there's a week in the spring and a week in the fall, but he never told them to keep a month. He never told them to set aside as sacred an entire season. He never told them to set aside a, a year. Verse 11, I am afraid for you, lest I have labored for you in vain. So, it's very important, their eternal life was at stake. If they turned and went back to either the Judaizing teachers or the pagan teachers who wanted them to go back. Now, there, the church has a lot of, um, uh, these, are, these are personal correspondence form letters. And I've got one that I wanted to just read parts of. Uh, this is a form letter the church has when someone writes in and asks about Galatians 4 verses 8 through 10. And I really like the way that uh, the author put a lot of these, a lot of these thoughts. So uh, the person I ask if this reference to days, months, season, and years was sweeping away the holy days and the Sabbaths. So it goes on, it says, there are several reasons this could not be so. First, observing new moons was never part of the worship of the God of the Old Testament. Uh, so, observing months cannot be referring to this practice. The Old Testament practice of marking new moons was merely to keep track of the passing of time so that Israel, without a, a convenient 
readily accessible calendar would be able to keep the holy days at the correct times. Now we have a calendar today. The Jews have a calendar. We follow the Hebrew calendar with a couple of, of differences. But continuing, it says, it's inaccurate to say that God commanded the Israelites to observe months and seasons. He ordered his people to keep specific days within certain months or seasons. And the two concepts are not the same. Even more conclusive is the language that Paul uses to introduce his reference to what the Galatians were doing. He called their practices weak and beggarly elements, which is a phrase he would never use in reference to God's holy days and Sabbaths, days he himself observed. On the contrary, Paul spoke positively even of sacrificial laws, which we all know were ended with the sacrifice of Christ. So it is inconceivable that he would refer to the Sabbath or any holy day as beggarly without any value, meaning without any value, whatever. So he used the words, you turn again, which is an obvious reference that their worship practices were in regression back to the way they previously followed. The Gentiles were, uh, excuse me, the Galatians were largely a Gentile congregation. So the reference could not for them be refer returning back to the Hebraic practices of Sabbath and Holy Days. Okay, uh, one more paragraph. Uh, many, many mistakenly assume that Paul addressed only one problem in Galatians and that the subject of verse 21 is the same as verses 9 and 10. You might scroll down to verse 21. That's where he said, Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? Well, we'll come, we'll come back to that very shortly. Uh, history indicates otherwise. The religious not, a philosophy of Gnosticism was a developing problem in the early church in the first century. Uh, it existed in many varied forms. Each drew upon a pagan mystery religion and an attempt and attempted to combine them with Christian teachings. Astrology was a principal factor in Gnostic beliefs, and hence Paul's reference to days, months, seasons, and years. So I think that's that's as far as I'll read there. But verse verses nine, verse ten, again. Very, uh, very commonly, these words are taken and used to sweep away the law of God. But let's uh, let's pick it up in verse twelve. Verse twelve, brethren, I urge you to become like me, for I became like you. You have not injured me at all. You know that because of physical infirmity, I preached the gospel to you at the first. Now here he refers to this thorn in the flesh. He called it in his second letter to Corinth. But um, it is speculated it may have been a vision problem. It may have been something about the way he looked. But we, uh, we, we aren't really fully told very clearly. I preach the gospel to you at first. Verse 14, in my trial, which was in my flesh, you did not despise or reject, but you received me as an angel of God. Now, angel, the Greek, uh, angelos, it, it's, it's a messenger. He was Paul's messenger sent to preach the gospel to them. You received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. So they took his words at face value that he was preaching them God's truth. So in verse 15, what then was the blessing you enjoyed? For I bear you witness that if possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. So again, here's another possible hint that he had vision problems that, hint, that limited his ability to serve. Verse 16, what then was the blessing you enjoyed? 
or I bear witness that if possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes. Okay, I just read that. Have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Well, obviously not. They, so they, this, this, again, think two groups, two audiences, two sets of false teachers, Judaizers, or those pulling them back toward paganism. They je zealously court you, but for no good. Yes, they want to exclude you, that you may be zealous for them. But it is good to be zealous in a good thing always, and not only when I am present with you. And then verse 19, my little children, for whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you, I would like to be present with you now and to change my tone, for I have doubts about you. You know, and I, I imagine that would be a very sobering thing to say. The apostle whom God had used to teach them the truth is writing to them. He is very distraught at how they're turning away from the, uh, the trunk of the tree as Paul had taught them and he's saying, I have doubts about you. I mean, that should rack, rattle them to the core. Well, let's go on to verse... 21, here's, there's, here's this verse as well that uh, is often twisted. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? And again, the overriding theme of this book is that salvation is the gift of God by faith. We cannot earn it with the, all the law keeping of a lifetime. So in verse 21, he returns to the Judaizers at the beginning of the chapter, teaching that a new convert needed to go back to what was added at Sinai, sacrifices, washings, and other ordinances, including circumstance, circumcision. And so he's asking them, do you really want to go back under the death penalty? Because when you attempted to keep them, you and everyone else but Christ failed. And so you incur the death penalty. The Judaizers were teaching them, you've got to go back and strive to perfectly keep the law and you'll be saved that way. But as we get to chapter five, the verses two and three, we see Paul goes back to circumcision, which is more primarily what he's focused on here. Now, he gives an example, a very simple example. In verse 22, where it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman. So here are two sons, two mothers, and they are representing two different covenants. One by a bondwoman. Well, that is Hagar. And Hagar, as... Abraham and Sarah had waited for years and decided, well, we need to help God out. You know, we always get in trouble when we decide we need to help God out. And so that brought about Hagar's handmaid. Abraham went to Hagar and Ishmael was born. The other by a free woman. Well, Hagar was a handmaid. She was a slave. The free woman is Sarah. Abraham, through Sarah, had the son of promise, who was Isaac. So in verse 23, but he who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh. Okay, it seemed natural, surely, to Abraham and Sarah that Hagar was, frankly, Sarah's property, and that if they reason that if she can't bear children, then my handmaid will for me. Well, he of the free woman was born a through promise. You see, God appeared. And he told him, you're going to have this son. And it was 24 years later, he appeared 
to them, well, a number of times, but he appeared to them on another occasion 24 years later and saying at about this set time next year, you're going to have that son. And they laughed, both of them. And Isaac means laughter. But it was beyond the time of normal childbearing. And so it was a promise. It was something they came to believe God, and he gave them that son. So, verse 24, which things are symbolic? So, you know, he's talking about a lot of analogies here. For these are two covenants. So he's saying we're not talking about two women and two sons. We're talking about two different covenants. The one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. Okay, Hagar represents Mount Sinai, the old covenant, the national covenant with Israel that was established there. Israel couldn't keep the law. They incurred death. Verse 25 for this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is. So a reference to the heavenly Jerusalem and is in bondage with her children. So they've continued to this day in bondage. Verse 26, but the Jerusalem above. So one covenant was established at Sinai. The other one is coming from the heavenly Jerusalem. The Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. And that's where we get this statement that the church is our, is our mother. For it is written, rejoice, O barren, and here he's, he's quoting from uh, back in Isaiah 54, verse 1. Rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear. Break forth and shout, you who, who do not labor. For the desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. So verse 28, okay, let, me, let me catch up on my notes over here. I think I think we are. So let me scroll on up. Now we, verse 28, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. So just as Isaac inherited the promises through Abraham by faith, so we are the recipients of God's forgiveness and grace and promise of eternal life and salvation through faith not through law keeping. Again, this is not saying we don't need to keep the law. That's not his point. Verse 29, but as he who was born according to the flesh, all right, that's talking about Ishmael, then persecuted him who was born according to the spirit. All right, remember the story from back in Genesis. Ishmael was mocking Isaac. He was scoffing. And you can make a note of Genesis 21, verse 9. Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had born to Abraham, scoffing. Well, then that led to what is said next. Verse 30, nevertheless, what does the scripture say? cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. And so that led to the events where Hagar and Sarah, uh, Hagar and Ishmael went out and nearly died in the, in the wilderness and anyhow went down a completely different life. Verse 31, so then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. We are not under the old covenant. With all of the laws that were added on top of the eternal law, um, we are we're of the free. We are of those who by faith walk by faith in Jesus Christ. We are the forgiven. He has paid the price in our stead. Okay, well, that's, uh, that's chapter four. And I think we'll find it's, it's going to get it easier the next two chapters. So let's, uh, let's see how far we get into chapter five.
in chapter five, now chapter five starts, the, the latter two chapters, he is discussing some of the privileges of being the justified, the forgiven of God, the ones who are walking by faith in Christ. Chapter five, verse one, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with a, boat, a yoke of bondage. Again, two audiences still. Jewish Christians don't be drawn back into some of the rites like circumcision that he'll mention in the next verse. Gentile Christians don't, don't go back into the worship of the, the pagan gods that aren't really gods that you came out of. Indeed, I, I indeed, uh, indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. Now, think about the two groups. If the person is a converted Christian and is a Jew by birth and was called to the church, Jewish families practice circumcision on the eighth day. It's not an issue. But when you have peoples who are called to the church from a Gentile, uh, a non-religious, a non-Christian background, they knew nothing of circumcision. If you become circumcised, so if you're going to go back to that, he says, you, know, you can't have it both ways. It's one way or the other. It's faith in Christ, or it's going back to all of the laws that you can't keep on your own anyhow. So, he takes circumcision as his primary example. Exhibit A, we would say. He doesn't say, don't go back to the Sabbath, as some try to write it in here and suggest that he's saying. If you're referring to laws that were added that brought them into bondage after they broke the law at Sinai. Verse 3, and I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. So he reminded them of what the apostle James wrote, that if you break one point of the law, you're guilty of it all. He reminds them you have to keep every last aspect of the law if you're going to go back to that. <clears throat> Verse 4, and you become estranged from Christ. Because again, you can't keep the law. You will sin. And your sins will cut you off from God. You who attempt to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. You see, again, there were those teaching, you can be saved by perfect law keeping. And Paul repeatedly points out, no, you can't. You're going to go back under death penalty. You have to walk by faith where the very righteousness of Christ is imparted to you. Verse 5, for we through the Spirit eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. And then verse 6, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything, but faith working through love. That is what avails everything. Now, let's pause here with, with this statement. He, he begins this scripture, and he's saying neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything. Uh, Paul uses this in other places as well. Um, I mean, the same phrase, phrase the same wording. In chapter 6, verse 15, chapter 6, verse 15, he says, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. The becoming a new creation in the hands of God, the master potter, is what is important. And then in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 19, 
he makes the statement that keeping the commandments of God is what matters. And that was after he used that same phrase that neither circumcision or under, uh, uncircumcision avails anything. What is it? What matters is keeping the commandments of God. Now, if Paul, you know, as so many teach, if Paul in chapters three and four is sweeping away the law, why does he say to the church at Corinth that what really matters is keeping the commandments? I mean, it just, it just, you can't have it both ways. Paul, Paul is the one that in Romans said the, the law is holy and right and good. He put it high on a pedestal. But he refused to accept teaching. He refused to teach that law keeping will save you. That is a gift of God. Always has been. So having the law written in their hearts and becoming like God, becoming a new cre creation is what matters. Let's go to verse 7. Verse 7, you ran well. In other words, he was there, he and Barnabas on the first missionary journey. They founded these churches. They were off and running. You were doing so well. And then he asks, who hindered you from obeying the law or obeying the truth? You know, who came along and wanted to bring you back to some of the things that were left behind? The adversary came along and hindered their growth. Well, verse 8, this persuasion does not come from him who calls you. So he tells them, this didn't come from God. Verse 9, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. You know, Christ used leaven as leaven of the, the Pharisees. Paul uses leaven, how leaven will spread. It will, it will permeate. It will, uh, it will permeate the entire batch of dough. Oh. Verse 11, and I, brethren, if I preach circumcision, why do I still suffer persecution? So again, remember, there were those Judaizers going through, following along wherever Paul had gone, trying to take Jewish Christians back to, their, to the past. And so... Paul says, if I'm preaching circumcision, then I wouldn't be persecuted, but I am being persecuted. Then the offense of the cross has ceased. So Paul, formally, before his calling of God, agreed with those who taught circumcision, but not, not any longer. In verse 12, I could wish that those who trouble you would even cut themselves off. And yes, you know, it, it means just the way it sounds there. Again, we're talking about circumcision. With circumcision, the sharp stone or blade cuts off the foreskin that is there by birth. And that's of the male sex member. Paul's saying, you just will cut off the rest of it. And that's very bluntly what he's saying. Verse 13, for you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. So the law was given to us. You know, it defines sin that we need to stay away from, but it also the law of God breaks down the very intention of the very thoughts of God's mind, the intention behind every word of God's law. And so having been forgiven, we are in that sense liberated from having a death penalty over us, but we don't use that as license to go out and live and do as we please. The law is still there as a standard by which we, with God's help, strive to live. And he, he, he mentioned through love, serve one another. Verse 14, 
And all the law is fulfilled in one word, and that is that word love. Even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And that is a statement that Jesus made, yes, as the second great commandment, but he was quoting from Leviticus 19, verse 18. The second great, great commandment came from the Torah, the Pentateuch. To love your neighbor as yourself. So the entire law is summarized in that, in that word. And then Jesus, when he was here, he broke it down that love is love to God. That's the great commandment. And the second one, is love to fellow man. And when a Christian genuinely walks in accordance with love toward others, then he will be fulfilling the intention behind God's law. Verse 15, but if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you are consumed by one another. So, anyhow, let's go on a, a bit further here. Verse 16, I say then walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Again, they are they are opposites. They're different poles. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary to one another. Those led by the Holy Spirit, those who are recipients of the Holy Spirit, they have been forgiven, and they are no longer under a penalty for having broken that law. It is now forgiven. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law in the sense of this heavy death penalty. Those led of the Spirit are not under the death penalty. It has been paid. We have been given the undeserved grace of God. Now, verse 19, I actually thought we we might get about this far, but I'll go ahead and get started. Verse 19, now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery. When Paul gives sin lists, it seems he always starts with sexual sins. There's so much of that. But let's pause right there. As I have in the notes, if the Ten Commandments have been done away with. Why does Paul return and stresses what happens to those who don't obey the commandments and the law? So he begins a list and um, adultery, fornication. And adultery is the two different Greek words here, morteia. And then pornea is fornication, sexual immorality. It covers really covers all bases. Uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, the occult, demonism, hatred, contention, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies. Envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. So there are some 17 that are listed. 17 works of the flesh. 17 sins. And then notice that he says, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And that pretty much covers his statement on the law of God. He has not, he is not sweeping it aside. He is saying that your salvation is an issue of faith. It is a gift of God. But because we are God's forgiven, we strive with God's help to live in accordance with his commandments and to 
abstain from all of these 17 sins that he just mentioned and many others. Those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And in verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is, and we're very familiar with this area, and I you know, really did not plan to stop and really dwell on these. We, we are very familiar with these, but in contrast to 17 sins, he gives us nine fruits, nine evidences of the presence of the Spirit of God. <clears throat> Love, and that's agape. Joy. Joy should be one of the great hallmarks of a converted mind. Uh, in spite of all the trials and tests and hard times that may come, we still, there's a joy, not the same as happiness, but there's a joy because we, we know where God's plan is going. Peace. You know, the world, the world views peace as the absence of war. But peace is something that Jesus said that Passover night, peace I give to you, not as the world gives, <clears throat> but a peace of mind. And then he says, long suffering. Patience, yes, but there are times we do suffer long with different things. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness gentleness, self-control, against such there is no law. So we live our life within the realm of these eight fruits, uh, nine fruits, pardon me, then nothing in any of these breaks the law of God. And those who are, you know, let me scroll up again. Those who are in Christ's, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So if we are Christ's, we are forgiven. We walk by faith. The righteousness of Christ is imparted to us. And we have a battle. We still have a struggle. Because this, this old guy we thought we buried <laughs> keeps popping up, trying to lead us in the wrong way. There still will be a carnal nature, carnal mind, a tendency to rebel against the law of God. If we live in the Spirit, we also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. So that brings us to the, the end of chapter 5. And that will be our breaking point for, uh, for the Bible study.